Good, e good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this evening's inaugural lecture. Uh, you may notice a slight departure from the normal protocol for this evening. The Vice Chancellor, uh, unfortunately, is unable uh, to be here this evening. So he's asked me, as Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, to uh, introduce the lecture uh, and also to, um, to, to, to close proceedings uh, later this evening. Um, it's a great pleasure to see so many people here for the latest uh, in the series of uh, inaugural lectures this year. Um, as we all know, I think inaugural lectures are a kind of rite of passage for the lecturer. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a really important opportunity for a, a, a new professor um, to um, set out their stall, as it were, to, um, to say something about their understanding of uh, their vision for uh, the particular subject that they uh, have uh, been promoted to profess. And um, I think uh, it will be, for that reason, a very auspicious occasion. Of course, these are also very important uh, occasions, uh, not only professionally, but also in the personal and, and family sense. And uh, it is great to uh, see here not only colleagues from Kiel, students from Kiel, but also, I'm sure, colleagues uh, from... Uh, uh, elsewhere in the sector who, who recognize uh, Fazana's work and the, the great contribution that she's made to her discipline. And also, it's, it's a great pleasure to see members of Fazana's family here and, uh, and, and other friends, and I know she'll be wanting to say something about that her, herself. Um, you will have read um, the, uh, the uh, description of Fazana and her work that, that was circulated in advance of the lecture, but let me just, if, if I may, just rehearse... Um, uh, some of the details of that. Um, Fazana is a professor of sociology of education and she's also director of postgraduate research in education in the uh, School of Public Policy and Professional Practice here at Kiel. Um, she has researched and written very extensively in the field of uh, sociology of education. The topics of her research include uh, the leadership and management of change in the further education workplace, educational inequalities, uh, and the changing identities of young people in a global context. And she is the author of two single-authored monographs. Uh, most recently, in 2011, The New Folk Devils, Muslim Boys and Education, uh, and uh, earlier in 2003, The Schooling and Identity of Asian Girls. Uh, both of these works explore the social and political identifications of young people in a schooling context. And clearly, I'm sure we can all recognize uh, the enduring topicality of, of that work. Um, Fazana um, completed her PhD and then worked for Victim Support in London. Um, she returned to Kiel in 1997 uh, to become a research fellow on a, an ESRC-funded uh, project on changing teaching and managerial cultures in further education. Um, in 1999, she was appointed to a lectureship in education and was promoted to senior lecturer in 2004 and to professor from, I think, the 1st of January 2013. Um, Fazana has, over the years, supervised a great number of doctoral students, um, including 10 to successful completion on a wide range of sociological and education topics. Um, she's currently leading a funded project called the Stoke Primary Schools Project. It's funded by the city of Stoke-on-Trent, uh, which deals with the issue of attainment at Key Stage 1 in Stoke-on-Trent, and that's a project that will run uh, through to 2016. She's also recently completed a British Academy-funded project on children's understandings of peak oil uh, in, that, was, that ran in 2012 to 2013. Um, she is uh, a member of uh, the editorial board of the British Socio Journal of Sociology of Education, uh, and of a number of other journals as well, and has a strong record of uh, providing peer review and advice to, to the uh, disciplinary community. In this evening's lecture, Fazana proposes to explore some of the tensions and contradictions that are inherent in state policies and professional practices aimed at preparing children for the future. She'll question whether notions of student voice, participation, and sustainability currently embedded in educational policy and practice in Europe serve to promote or constrain the political agency of children and young people. Yet again, a range of extremely topical issues that I'm sure will be of uh, huge interest to, to everybody here. So, without further ado, it's my great pleasure formally to welcome Fazana Shane, Professor of Sociology of Education, and invite her to present her inaugural lecture, From Global Wars to Sustainable Futures, Children, Politics, and Education. 
Professor Shea. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to thank Professor Shepherd for his very kind introduction. And I'm just so delighted and touched um, to see so many friends here, um, especially those who've traveled a distance to, to come tonight. It's both exciting but also extremely daunting um, to speak in front of people who've been great mentors and role models um, and whose work I've been inspired by. I'd especially like to thank um, Miriam, David, Joe Sim, Helen Gunter, Chrissy Rogers, and, and uh, Pat Smith for coming, um, traveling specially to come here tonight. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to see so many of my colleagues from Kiel here um, and my great research students. There's so many of them here tonight, and that's, that's, that's lovely to see. Um, I'd like to thank Tracy Roberts and the office staff in the School of Four Ps for their, Tracy in particular, for her fantastic effort in terms of managing the publicity for this event, but also for years of solid support in, in education. I'm really pleased to see my family here, and I want to apologize for being rubbish at returning phone calls over the last couple of years. Um, and if you want to know why, you can blame him. Or <laughs> I'm trying to find Cropper somewhere. He's the other one um, for, for workload issues. Um, and last but not least, I'd like to thank um, my girls, Leila, Syra, Ada, Elia, um, and um, Sojana for, for also coming and um, I'm going to thank Bullen even though he didn't thank me <laughs> <He's a noble. laughs> um, but if you if you see this you'll probably see why <laughs> this is a picture that um, my youngest drew <laughs> and that's Bullen <laughs> and, and it is absolutely true <laughs> as well and you know he, he has he literally does do all the housework, um, which, which I'm very thankful for. And just finally, I'd, I'd like to thank um, Anne Hughes and, and David Shepherd for supporting me through, through my promotion. I'm sorry if I've left anyone out, but uh, I'm extremely nervous, so I um, hope you'll, uh, you'll forgive me. Okay, so um, I'd like to, to start by explaining why... Um, I chose this particular topic of children, politics, and education, and there, there, this is the structure that I'll be talking to. But there are two main reasons. First, because it brings together a number of strands within my research in the last two decades, um, and that's my work on the uh, children's experiences of schooling, their political understandings, and a little bit on education policy as well. As well. Um, I also chose this topic because, as I noted in the abstract, um, despite the fact that children and young people are bearing the brunt of the economic recession and they face um, a, num a series of other challenges, including uh, we've had ahead of um, the economic forum in Davos startling statistics on, on growing inequalities between the rich and poor um, increasing social inequality sharpened by the 2008 crisis, um, a series of environmental challenges including food and water shortages and unsustainable global uh, growth. And young people are, based, are at, at the sharp end of that. Yet too often through education and media discourses we're bombarded with quite negative uh, deficit talk about young people. They're either feral, they lack the right skills, they don't have the right mindset to engage in the lab labor market, they're not aspirational enough, they're um, not hardworking enough, or that they're apolitical and disengaged from the processes of local democracy. I could go on. <laughs> um, so what I'd like to do in this lecture is to counter some of these deficit narratives by drawing on the, my own research and the research of others 
conducted in educational settings to illustrate the ways in which young children and young people are actively engaged in making sense of their social and political environments. But I also want to critically explore some of the policy and curricular strategies that have been tried out in English education over the last two decades. Um, and I'll, I'll focus on um, three of them. But my starting point is Raywin Connell's observation about the relationship between education and politics. Education and politics are fundamentally related. I'd like to unpack this a bit before I move on to look at the formal curriculum because it's important in terms of understanding the context in which young people's social and political work takes place. For me, this translates into three main points. I might skip the middle one because <laughs> if, if, uh, it's quite a long one. Uh, but anyway, the first one is that education policy doesn't just exist in a social or political vacuum. It's shaped by and contributes to wider processes of economic, political, and social change. So if we take ex as examples two of the most significant education acts in the last century, the 1944 Education Act, which was based on the mantra of education for all, emerged in a period of relative optimism underpinned by economic policies aligned with a state commitment to full employment and a political and social obligation to the redistribution of e equality. But despite the stated aim of increasing opportunities for all, sociologists of education, as they often do, found that the middle classes were the main beneficiaries of the act. The role played by educational processes in sorting and sifting children through processes of labeling and setting, as well as the embedded middle class values of the education system contributed to the reproduction of existing inequalities. The 1988 Reform Act arrived at a time of significant economic and industrial decline following the recessions of the 1970s. The resort to a market model and opening up competition set in motion policies and processes um, that would continue, to, would contribute to further exacerbation of inequalities experienced by disadvantaged groups. So in relation to both acts, the designs of education systems reflected processes of wider social change, but education policies and processes were also significant in producing new forms of injustice in education and wider society. The second um, point that um, links to this is that um, the education is, is that the economic, political, and social forces that underpin state policies are first and foremost global and systemic. And there have been two major and interlinked developments that have impacted on, on the course of education policy in England over the last 50 years. The first is the loss of Britain's colonies at the end of World War II, which was largely followed by the active recruitment of workers from former colonies to fill labor shortages created by the immediate aftermath of the war. However, the loss of its colonies did not necessarily lead to a post-colonial state identity and culture for Brit the British state in the initial decades. As Paul Gilroy has argued, a post-colonial melancholia or a repeated failure to let go of, of its imperial past has shaped British state relations and policy in relation to both ethnic minority students and in relation to the curricular projects that have been developed since. So we see this constant attempt to reintroduce um, particular versions of history into to the curriculum. The other is the economic decline that followed on from the end of the initial boom of the post-war World War II period, and the decline is associated with the economic structuring that involved a shift in the economic base from a manufacturing to a service sector, as a result of which unemployment increased in general and especially for young people. The 
the, the third point is, though, that although education is generally shaped by, but is not exclusively determined by economic and political changes, as Ken Jones has argued, schools are places where attempts occur to realize the designs of policy to produce responsible citizens and capable workers, but they're also places where these policies and processes have been resisted. So what we've seen in education is um, a series of attempts, or we've seen school, that schools are sites of agency and resistance individually and collectively expressed in ways that range from classroom resistance, playground and corridor talk to organized pro protests against imperialism. We've also seen in recent years anti-academies movements, teachers movements against testing, anti-deportation campaigns that children have been at the forefront of. I'd like to, to move on now to look at, in more detail, at the role of formal education in enabling or inhibiting the capacity of children to engage in social and political action. The curricular policies that I want to focus on are these three, and they've formed the backdrop to my own research, um, but also have been central to the production of a range of academic debates about the possibilities for engaging education in radical or progressive um, <clears throat> politics. Whether that's linked to the environment or democratic or cosmopolitan citizenship. The problem with the literature is that it's so diffuse and um, the notion of education for citizenship is so contested. We've seen various attempts at different kinds of pedagogy, feminist pedagogy, critical race theory, um, education for cosmopolitan citizenship, education for democratic or global citizenship. And more recently, we've seen attempts to combine aspects of env environmental and social democratic forms of citizenship through notions of ecological and sustainability citizenship. But just how much of these debates have actually found their way into the formal curriculum? We'll start with um, a look at citizenship education. This was um, already one of the five cross-curricular themes introduced by the Conservative government in the 1990s, but the Crick Review, which was commissioned by New Labour and the report published in 1998, argued for a stronger focus on political literacy. Crick, the architect of the review, aimed at no less than a change in the political culture of this country, both nationally and locally. The aim of citizenship education for Crick was to encourage young people to think of themselves as active citizens, willing and able to have an influence in public life. The report suggested that um, political apathy amongst young, the young was inexcusably and damagingly bad and concluded that democracy itself was under threat and that we needed citizenship education to, to stem the rising tide of this political disengagement. But Crick tried to, to move his version of citizenship education on from um, the version that had been tried out by um, the Conservatives, which had revolved around the idea of, of young people helping each other, a notion that re-emerged through volunteering more recently. For Crick, what citizenship education offered was um, not just knowledge and understanding um, of topics, including laws and rules of, of democracy um, concepts, but also the skills of inquiry and communication, critical thinking, so that students would have the opportunity to put that into practice through debates through negotiating and deciding and taking responsibility in school or community activities. In the aftermath of the London bombings, a fourth pillar was added to the, the citizenship education curriculum, which was living together identity and diversity. But strangely enough, in the report, the Ajegbo report, there was 
very, there was literally no mention of the war on terror or the 7-7 bombings and the very little in terms of uh, contemporary examples of racism. It relied very much on historical cases of racism to encourage people to, to live together. So um, it was heavily um, criticized. Alongside citizenship education, we've also had the notion of pupil voice. This is one academic definition of voice and the other notion of participation that goes along with it. And this has been a, another attempt at encouraging young people to get involved in decision making in, in, in schools. In his foreword to the key document that um, put forward the idea of, of giving children and young people a say, this is also influenced by human rights agenda, of course, and Article 12 of the United Nations Convention on the, the Rights of, of the Child, which Britain belatedly addressed. It got to about 2004 before this policy um, came through. What um, Stephen Twigg um, lent his support to, as you can see from the bit that I've underlined, is a particular notion of uh, participation and voice, which firmly defines students as customers or consumers. And that's quite problematic um, in, in that it's removed from the democratic notion that, that it originally came from and the radical traditions within inclusive education. And so one of the questions that um, did emerge from the citizenship education agenda was what happens then when students do express their voice or um, exercise their, their democratic rights to protest as they did when um, school students walked out of class, some of them as young as 10, to demonstrate against the Iraq war in 2003. Um, hundreds, literally hundreds of school children walked out um, across cities, including Cardiff, Dundee, Cambridge, Edinburgh, Preston, Scarborough, the list goes on, and um, gathered around the, uh, some of them gathering around the Houses of Parliament um, in a campaign that was described as the most significantly child-led campaign by Cunningham and Lavalette for, for over a century. What happened was that um, these children were, were um, dismissed by the education establishment as irresponsible truants, even though many of them had parental permission to be on protests. The education authority clamped down on them. And um, so even though Crick had, had mentioned in his report that it would be good for students to go on an occasional demo, when it actually happened, the reaction was quite austere. And the question was, that, that do they actually know what they're talking about? Do they actually know about the war? Do they know why, why it's happening? And are they actually engaging um, with, with good cause? As, but as you can see from this quote, the, the young person there um, makes a very clear argument about why they want to express their voice in particular. Um, <clears throat> Some of those involved in the protest were boys that I interviewed for my research project um, that was for the book, The New Folk Devils, which essentially set out to look at the impact of the war on terror on young people's experiences in school. And one of the boys here talks about the, the lockdown in, in his school. And we know that, that students were were told, it's not teachers were um, just being uh, authoritarian or, or disciplinary, they were told um, to, to take that approach and to actually stop them from um, protesting. Another one talking about um, why he didn't go on it. I don't think that was a holiday, but uh, he... Um, 
And um, Hamid was one of the boys who'd, who'd actually gone on a demonstration in, in, in London in September 2002 against the Afghanistan war. And he talked about his curiosity and why he'd, he'd um, gone on that, that march. Obviously, Miss Dynamite was a, <laughs> a, a good attraction. Um, but um, the other reason was that there was, if you imagine after September 11, the atmosphere, the tension that was in schools and the intense scrutiny, it put teachers in a very difficult position. I think in the schools where I did this research, it was a, a, across two schools, and I also um, interviewed the boys in a youth group. Um, it, it was an immense pressure on both the staff and the students because of the tensions and the possibility that fights might break out. So teachers were also in a very difficult position. And so there were lots of gaps and silences. There weren't the opportunities to, to talk about this, even though if you look at the citizenship curriculum, it makes mention of all these political issues and um, uh, th there was literally very little coverage of it in, in, in the school curriculum. So that carries on. And then this one incident where um, Hamid's teacher spontaneously stopped a lesson to talk about the war. And it was just for a joke the boys had talked about they, what they'd do after school, which was to, to go and join the Taliban. And um, the teacher in this instant just stopped the lesson and actually focused the whole lesson on this issue, which was, which was great for the boys because it took away that sort of edge. Um, elsewhere, it, it, I found that some, some of the students were um, feeling quite marginalized by the lack of discussion or the, the, the way that the, the protest, the, the war was being talked about in schools. As, Another boy said, you know, we've been, we, we learn about um, war as part of the syllabus, but not this war. This is something that just isn't discussed. And when they do talk about it, it's, it's in, a, 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 in a very biased way, and it was pushing some of them to some extent to um, um, defend Osama bin Laden and to circulate actually conspiracy theories, and there was a little bit of that which is what happens when there are, there's no opportunity to, to uh, discuss these things openly. So it raises questions about voice and, and citizenship education in that, as, as Michael Fielding says, if, when, whose voice is authorized? Who gets the opportunity to speak? So with voice, students are encouraged to be part of school councils, um, some students were encouraged to be involved in the hiring and firing, well, not firing, hiring of staff. <laughs> that, that, that would be an interesting one. Um, and in, in the media backlash, we were told that students were asking questions like, you know, if you were a font, which font would you be? Um, and asking teachers to sing nursery rhymes like Humpty Dumpty as part of this, the um, appointment process. Um, so quite a backlash against children being given th this opportunity, but it was particular children and the usual suspects, usually white, privileged um, students above those that, that perhaps are, are disadvantaged or, or just the people that managed to, to get their voices heard. So as Fielding says, whose voice is authorised, what are they allowed to speak about, what kinds of knowledge um, is is is. It's, it's accepted, uh, um, so it, 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 it um, what counts as legitimate knowledge. So on the one hand, what you see is um, these attempts to encourage children to, to take part in, in um, school decision-making processes, but there are other students who at the same time were being subject to extreme surveillance and monitoring um, through I'll just skip slightly through the um, prevent agenda under count the counter-terrorist legislation, the prevent arm of um, the Home Office's contest strategy. Um, it's reported that, I don't know whether, in, in Aaron Konani's report, uh, which was a review of the prevent strategy, he mentioned that a counter-terrorist 
officer had told him that children as young as four were being monitored for signs of extremism. And so it was their drawings to see if they were drawing about religion. Um, and this was quite serious. In, in schools and colleges, in colleges uh, in particular, FE tutors were being asked to um, immediately call the police if they had any suspicions about uh, children being involved in, or young people being involved in, in terrorism or extremism. So extreme atmosphere of, of surveillance. That was legitimized through security and the war on terror. What we see in the latest education bill, which was introduced in 2011, um, is, is something which generalizes that surveillance and monitoring of students. And again, read against notions of voice is, is quite striking. Um, just, oops just play you what Nick Gibb says about it. I think that's enough of him. <laughs> but you can see that what, what's happened is effectively stop and search is being brought into schools. And these are powers that teachers don't particularly want, but they do have the right to delete material off students' phones, um, and uh, basically it's not just confiscating phones, which was something that, that teachers had the power to do before, but it is literally to, to um, detain them under any suspicion of any act that might harm another student. Obviously there's, there's concern about cyberbullying, but I think we need to weigh up um, the versus civil rights and, and privacy. So what we have is the notion of pupil voice, but on the other hand, extreme monitoring and surveillance of, of young people. The third area that um, has been developed around sort of a futures approach is sustainable development, which taking the World Commission on the Environment and Development Brundtland Report is, is defined in this way. The UK strategy, Securing the Future, um, set out five principles, living with environmental limits, ensuring a strong, healthy and just society, achieving a sustainable economy, promoting good governance and using sound science responsibly. In education, this translated into these eight doorways. The reason, I mean, I'm not from an environmental education background, but the reason I became interested in this as a topic for, for research was um, through the project on peak oil. Um, and what I, I noticed in my research for that, um, peak oil is um, a concept that uh, sets, that here it is. It's the simplest label for the problem of energy resource depletion, and it's about the peak in the production of oil, so that oil is not going to run out, but that it becomes more expensive to produce, which explains why petrol prices might, might be rising, um, and why we, we have fracking as another uh, way of, of trying to extract oil. Um, The new Labour government set out plans to, for all schools to become sustainable schools by um, 2008. But under the coalition government, which described itself as the greenest government ever, the sustainability is, is um, being left to schools. So it's up to schools to decide how they want to do it. Um, as I was saying, this, the, the reason why I came to this project was because in previous work, war, global war had been a common theme in the research that I'd done with children. They talked um, quite often about the role of oil in, in, in politics and in global politics and the, the, as a cause of, of war. And so that led me to think about, well, how much do they understand about the relationship between um, oil and its role in, in, in war and the notion of, of peak uh, of peak oil. And so that led to this um, small scale, very small scale pilot study project 
um, which was conducted across three local schools with, in total, 102 children being interviewed across focus groups and um, around 17 teachers and a very tiny group of parents. And um, what we found was that um, while climate change had become quite embedded in the curriculum, there's very little coverage on peak oil in, in uh, QCA documents, even though there are various initiatives like eco schools, transition towns, there was very few references to peak oil. Um, in terms of how children understood peak oil, which was one of our research questions, is how do they understand the concept, how do they relate it to their own lives and the lives of others from a social justice perspective, do they connect it to issues of um, inequality, inequity? Um, we found that um, children understood the technical aspects of peak oil, fractional distillation, uh, supply and demand, but they weren't connecting it necessarily to the social and political implications. That the teaching was quite scattered. Even though we came across some excellent schemes of work, we found um, examples of modules on uh, contested planet and energy security in which some of that was going on. But in general, across the three schools, teaching of, of peak oil is, is quite patchy. And one of the reasons, going back to Nick Gibbs' quote and the emphasis on achievement and testing, is literally that, that it's not an area that is, is being tested in, in exams. The technical aspect is, but not the social and the political implications. And so what teachers were telling us was, um, it's an important thing to teach, but if it had more relevance to the final exam, then we would teach it. So unless that happens, you're going to skirt around it, you're not going to spend as much time on it, and that, that's going to be your problem. So in the interviews, teachers were coming up with fantastic ideas about how they might teach it, how they might develop it as a cross-curricular theme and connect it to all those things that, that Crick talks about in citizenship curriculum. But in reality, they're completely pushed as an overcrowded curriculum, and um, the the emphasis has to be on what kinds of knowledge will be examined. So again, endlessly, we got this, this response that it comes down to exam boards. If they want to start putting these questions on, on the papers, then, then people will obviously be told to teach about them more. One surprising finding, I don't know why I say surprising, because actually, um, given previous research, there, there was quite a lot of connection made by students uh, between um, oil, and so this one wasn't surprising, but the glo in terms of the global dimension, students were talking about, these in a, about the role of oil and wars, again, that, um, we're, that this, this is one of the areas in which there's, there's um, global inequities. The other one that came up was Primark and the amount of money it costs to ship clothes or cheap clothes to other countries and how that might connect the, the arguments about cheap labor or slave labor. So children were thinking quite hard about these issues, um, which was, was very, very positive. But what was a little bit depressing was in terms of their local or immediate environments, <coughs> discourses of choice and inconvenience dominated their talk about alternatives. So while they recognized that, that you know, these people are being treated as slaves over there. When it comes to sitting next to someone in their own community on a bus, this is something they didn't want to do. They, they talk about them as chavs, as minging, and um, this is something they just don't want to, to get on with. And so we, we, you find that um, they're not interested in um, <laughs> recognizing inequalities more locally, which is... Um, a little bit sad, and some work to be done there. But coming back to, to more serious matters, uh, 
some children felt that this, this was an issue that actually they didn't need to know about because it doesn't have any direct bearing on them, peak oil. Why, why should we worry about the rising petrol prices when we don't drive? It's not going to affect us now. Um, and yet there were, there were other students who were really quite keen to get knowledge about the issue and to take responsibility for it. That, you know, we're relying on, on your generation and we, we're the ones who need to sort this out, so we do need this um, knowledge and information. So where do we go from here? Just before we get to... <laughs> yes, that is probably what everyone wants to do. I just want to... to um, come back to sort of some initial points. My focus has been on um, formal education and um, clearly there's been a relentless focus on um, testing in education on competition. We, we hear about the, the pupil international uh, assessment, the PISA tests. Um, and how the focus of those is on um, competencies in maths, science and English and not other kinds of, of learning that, that narrows the agenda uh, or the space available to teach about these other issues. Um, citizenship education, as you can see, is, is also something that um, is riven with tensions between a social control and a democratic function. But I don't think we should give up on education just yet. I think there's still a role for, for formal schooling to develop knowledge. As those young people were, were, were saying that they, um, they do want to know about these issues. They do think that that's something that uh, education can teach them and then that they take that knowledge and do something with it. So I'd like to think that there's still um, hope uh, to, to develop these alternative agendas in education, even though times are, are quite difficult. And we have had a whole history of various critical uh, radical traditions from feminism and feminist pedagogies being tried out to critical pedagogy. And um, there's a need to try and connect up those, those agendas. So on that touchy-feely note, <laughs> I'm gonna um, end and invite you to go for your drinks and canapes. Thank you.